Just a few housekeeping items. Sorry about that, I lost my PowerPoint. There we go. Um, okay, there's lovely pictures of our presenters that I just introduced. Um, here we go, just a few housekeeping items. Feel free to submit any questions through the webinar platform. There will be a Q&A session during the last 15 minutes. Unanswered questions will be responded to after the event if we don't have time at the end of the webinar to get to all of them. And a webinar replay will be provided to all attendees after the event via email. If you'd like to contact us directly, our phone and email address is shown below. And so I would like to start by handing um, this over to our first speaker, Brian Clark. Thanks, Faith. Uh, welcome, everyone. Today we're going to talk about uh, law for website content, how it should be written, and how it should be organized. We're going to start by understanding exactly how your prospective clients read your website content. We'll cover some basic concepts about how people read any type of website content, and from there we'll explore some ideas about how you should develop your website content based on that online reading behavior. We're also going to talk about the relationship between website content and search engine optimization. Joining me today is Jim Pantelopoulos. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Brian. Yes, we can define SEO as a narrow technical aspect of a website and content as a much broader in scope. Uh, the way to ensure the success of content marketing is to apply SEO techniques, which we'll, we'll be discussing as we go along in the slides. So the two actually converge together, and there is no SEO without content. In summary, you can say that SEO needs keywords, and content supplies it. SEO needs internal links, and content gives it. SEO needs on-site technical strategies, such as the metadata, the titles, and the sitemaps, and content deliver, del delivers it. Brian, talk a little bit more about the words on the page. Sure. Let's talk about the actual value of the words on your website. You may have the sense that every word on your website is important and requires your careful consideration. You might have heard that advice from other attorneys who have gotten leads from their websites and they feel that's based on the very specific word choices that they made. Or it might just be your own instinct that the content on your website can make or break your online reputation so every word counts. But at the same time, you may have heard that people don't actually read website content. They supposedly just look at the first few words or the biggest words, the words in bold, words in a different color, and then they move on. So how can both of these things be true? Do people read your website very carefully or do they hardly read it at all? Well, let's take a poll and see what they think. Uh, which of these statements do you agree with more? Every word on your website is important or visitors won't read your website content. And are we, are we set up to, ta to take a, an audience poll here? Great, let's take a look at the results. So we're choosing between uh, these, these two ideas, uh, which are not necessarily mutually exclusive. I guess we'll, uh, we'll see which way people tend to lean. Uh, do you value uh, every word on your website, and, and do you think that your visitors do? Or do you think that for the most part, uh, people are not looking uh, at, at your website content? They're not really reading it. So it looks like the results are uh, just about in. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised to see that result. Uh, more than two times uh, over, over the other choice, uh, most visitors won't read your website content. Now, that doesn't mean that every word is, uh, is not important. And again, these, these two ideas do not have to uh, exist uh, independently of each other. In fact, what we're going to talk about today is the idea that both of these statements are true. Uh, you, you need to create a, a strong first impression with your content so that people will go on uh, to, to read your website in more detail. Some people, in fact many people, will scan your website content and based on that initial scan they're going to decide whether they want to stay uh, or the, whether they want to go elsewhere and, and look for services from another law firm. Those who do stay will identify the areas they want to read more carefully and some of those people will be inspired to contact you based on what they read. So you need to set up your content with the understanding that website visitors process your content in two stages, scanning and reading. 
for people who are scanning and making an initial decision, your content needs to create a good first impression, make them feel that they've come to the right place, and motivate them to stay and read more. Then your content needs to make a lasting impression that builds the reader's trust in you and motivates that reader to contact you. Now, how do we know that website visitors scan your content before they decide to read it? We know that because there is actual data on this behavior. Many studies have been done that support this general idea of the quick scan, but it was most effectively demonstrated in 2011 by the Nielsen Norman Group, a well-respected company that conducts evidence-based research, um, evidence-based user experience research. And that means they observe how consumers interact with online technology and they measure these results. And what they found in 2011 gives us the title of today's presentation. You've got 10 seconds to grab people's attention. That's because those first 10 seconds are about decision making. The website visitor or user, in the words of the study, is deciding, should I stay or should I go? And the chance that they will decide to leave is much higher in those first 10 seconds. So what, is, what exactly is the visitor looking at in those first 10 seconds? You may be thinking, what about design? Aren't they reacting to that? Yes, there is definitely an initial reaction to color, images, and layout. Design is important, there's no question, but top-level messaging is just as important. Along with any initial reaction the visitor may have to colors and images, the visitor wants to decide, does the content here pertain to my legal problem? Is it conceivable that I might find a solution to my problem here? So they scan the content for basic information that will help them decide whether they should stay on the site and try to learn more. Jim, what are some of the other factors in a visitor's initial experience of website content? Right. As well as how the site looks, it should be responsive, or at the very least, should be mobile friendly. Google does give a slight ranking boost for responsive websites. The idea of a responsive design is to build pages that detect the visitor screen site in orientation. Once detected, the page changes the layout accordingly, thus minimize scrolling, makes the fonts and pictures the correct size, and possibly eliminates those flashy banners and images. If the user isn't able to easily access your content, they're certainly not going to read it. One more thing that gives an overall impression is how fast the website performs, both in mobile and desktop environments. Your content is great, but if it's taken 10 seconds for it to load, and if that's all the time a visitor has, well, he's going to bounce. Bright, I see you have an interesting image coming up. Yes, I, I love this image. It ha helps us understand more about how the visitor scans website content. Another study by the Nielsen Norman Group in 2006 used eye tracking software to study people's online reading behavior. And these are the best known images from that study, showing the amount of time readers' eyes were focused on particular parts of the web page they were asked to read. The red areas indicate places that readers spent a lot of time. Yellow, they spent less time. And blue, they basically just glanced at it. And what we learn from these images is that people focus very strongly on content that appears in the top left corner of the web page, where most people start reading anything. Their focus remains strong right across the top section of the page, but then their eyes quickly move down, looking for the next main idea. And when they find the next idea, they give it some focused attention, but then their eyes quickly begin moving down again. And because these patterns resemble the letter F, this has come to be known as the F-shaped reading pattern. Jim, how does Google consider this reading pattern? Well, yes, in addition to the scan pattern of readers, the Google Spider itself scans the page in an F pattern to get an idea if the introductory few words meet the searcher's query. In terms of SEO, the F pattern benefits the website that have relevant content for the spiders. And the F pattern provides useful content for the reader at the beginning of the page. Well, as we'll see in the upcoming slides, when writing web content, you want to put keywords where people notice them the most. For, for example, at the beginning of the headings, subheadings, and paragraphs. And this way, when the visitor is just gazing, he can quickly decide about the relevancy and uselessness of the page to their question. Right, why don't you go over the key areas that visitors scan? Absolutely. You need to put the most important information in places that fall within the F-shaped reading pattern because that's where people are looking when they scan your website content and, and make their first impression. These places include the top banner area, the page section headers, and the introductions and conclusions. 
Let's take a closer look at each of these important areas, and we'll start with the top banner of your website. The top banner is the term we'll use today for the portion of any website's homepage that a visitor sees before they see any of your narrative content. It's an area that's built for scanning, not reading. On your law firm website, elements that you're likely to place in this area include your firm name, ideally in the form of a logo like you see here, your phone number, some basic navigation that allows people to find their way to other parts of your website, some images that communicate your practice areas. But the part we want to focus on now is the summary statement. This is your opportunity to communicate quickly here in this very important visual area, the most essential information that people need when they're making a fast decision about whether they have come to the right law firm website. That essential information can be described as the four W's, who, what, where, and when. You're probably familiar with a variation of this called the five W's, but we're going to hold the fifth W for later. We're going to get back to that. Right now, the four W's are an idea about information that originated in ancient Greek philosophy. And in the modern era, it was reinvented as a way for journalists to remind themselves to present all necessary information at the beginning of their stories. We also use this idea in website content now to remind ourselves to put all essential information in front of the website visitor right away to let them know that they're in the right place. On your website, the who is you, an attorney, a law firm. The what is what you do, your practice area. The where is your location, or more importantly, the region that you serve. And the when is how long you've been practicing law. The, the when is very important to consumers. They want to know how much experience you have. If you're just starting out, it's understandable that you might want to de-emphasize that, but if you have more than 10 years of experience, that should really be a top-level data point for you. So imagine a visitor comes to this website and they need to decide if they've come to the right place. This statement gives them the information they need to make their first-level decision. Whose website is this? A law firm's website. What does this law firm handle? Bankruptcy. Where are they located? Atlanta. When did they start handling bankruptcy? 1991. So if the website visitor is an Atlanta resident who is looking for an experienced lawyer to help them resolve their debt, they now know that they might find uh, all of that if they stay here on this website and keep reading. That's why it's important to place a summary statement in the top banner of your website. Let's move on to another area that website visitors will scan for key information, the page section headers. Now here's an example of a web page that has only one header and that header doesn't have any useful information. Just let your eye move down the text block uh, and, and you can see that there are no points of focus, no organization of the material, no headers that communicate what the page is about. The one header at the top says, welcome to our website, which is friendly but not helpful. So if I'm just arriving on this website and I want to scan for basic information, uh, I can't do it very easily. Uh, Jim, can you tell us more about uh, how headings are important to, for SEO? Right. Headings are sections of your page content identified as H1, H2, H3 in the HTML or programming code of your website. H1 being the main heading and following the subheadings from there in order of importance. There are a few tools to identify the headings. We use a free tool called Screaming Frog here. Many people will just only scan the headings, so it's important to write them properly to catch the, visitor, the visitor's attention. In addition, a web page looks a lot cleaner, as you can see, and organized to a user with these tags. Now, Brian, getting back to the F pattern, the H1 tag is at the top of the start of the content, and as Google crawls your site, it identifies this tag and reads it to grasp the main topic of the page. Then Google continues to read the page and finds the H2 and H3 subheadings to see what else the page is about and whether it reinforces the topic of the page. Google will use this data as an element to rank your site. So yes, they have to be well written. The casual reader who wants to quickly zone in to see if this page answers the query will read the bolded headings to understand what the passage underneath contains. So in summary, the H1 tag communicates the page topic. The H2s, they explain what each section is about, subtopics. And H3 is a summary of the page topic. Let me explain some few do's and don'ts. Now everybody, if you, if you take a look at your website for these tags, take notice, of what, take notice of these basic do's and don'ts. So ask yourself, 
Are your headers loaded with repetitive and or ir irrelevant keywords? For example, a bunch of locations that capture every city you practice in. Do they make sense? Are they written in an unnatural language? This is what we call keyword stuffing. And Google has stated that this results in a negative user experience and can actually harm your site's rankings. Number two, have only one H1. The page content should discuss one to two main topics identified in the main H1 header and place it at the top. Don't place an H2 or other subheading above an H1. In other words, maintain hierarchy. Number three, don't repeat the exact same header in other pages. Make them unique. You want to target a specific main topic per page. You don't want to have what we call an SEO dupl duplicate content. It can result in a ranking penalty. And number four, don't write misleading headers. The content to follow the header should support the topic of the header. If your co content is about auto accidents, don't have a header containing criminal negligence. <laughs> Silly as it sounds, we've seen it in our audits. You know, you know, Google wants the content to be relevant to the headers and any keywords and phrases there. Have good content that engages a visitor. It's a great ranking signal for Google. Exactly. So writing good informative headers can improve your search results and improve the chances that a reader will engage with your content and with your website. The last key area of, of first impression that we'll talk about today, areas where website visitors may simply scan to make an initial decision, are your page introductions and conclusions. So where, where the top banner gave you the chance to summarize essential information in a single statement, and the section headers allowed you to summarize that information in a, a series of statements, it's in the introductions and conclusions where you can present that high-level information in narrative form. We can talk about introductions and conclusions together because they really serve the same goal, to summarize the information on the page in a bookend structure. You want to cover the same four W's, the who, what, where, and when, but now in paragraph form. When scanning, many readers who go beyond the headers will read only the introduction and conclusion, or only the introduction, or really only the first sentence of the introduction. Let's look at some examples. So here's an introduction that makes it very clear what's on offer at this law firm. If I'm scanning this content, I have plenty of opportunities to pick up the essential information. When I'm asking, who is this website telling me about? I see the words law firm, attorneys, certified mediators, lawyers. Uh, when I'm wondering, what do they do with this law firm? I see the answer, divorce, family law, legal issues, child custody, alimony, adoption, these are all there. Now I need to know where these services are offered. I see Atlanta, Fulton County, DeKalb County, Alpharetta, Roswell. And I'm wondering when this law firm started doing this kind of work since 1964. And, and note, Jim, how, uh, as you were saying, this is not keyword stuffing. This is natural use of the terms that are relevant to the reader, natural incorporation of the four Ws rather than, than creating artificial keyword constructions and, and stuffing them into rambling sentences that don't make sense. We're really supporting the ideas here with these words. That looks good. Now, now let's look at an uh, example of a, con a concluding paragraph from the uh, same page. This would be the same web page. It's the same firm, and now we're having a, a conclusion of this discussion, and, uh, and we see the same ideas being reinforced in this natural language. Who? A law firm with attorneys. What? Divorce and family law. Where? Atlanta. When? Well, it's okay to let the when go for the conclusion because we have something else important that we need to do in the conclusion. We're going to use a call to action. Let the reader know what they should do. Schedule a free consultation. Call us at this phone number. Contact us online at this link. Now, those visitors will more carefully read some of your uh, substantive content to, uh, to see if it supports the belief that you might be the one who can solve their problem, those visitors who have, have been persuaded by their initial scan. So let, let's talk about what type of language is appropriate for your, your deeper website content, the, the content really that, that goes throughout your site and is going to, to go into detailed discussion of, uh, of the law. Uh, let's start with, uh, with taking a, an audience poll uh, on the type of language that, uh, that should be used on your website. How would you explain this point of contractual law uh, in your website content? Would you say promissory estoppel compels performance of an assurance or a party to a contract must do what he promised. Which version of the, of the, same, uh, the same message is the best way to communicate to your clients about the law in your practice area content on your website? Let's, uh, 
open up the polls here. Hey, Brad, while we're waiting for the polls, that's a nice hammock. You don't got one of those in the back of your <laughs> house, do you? <laughs> I think uh, so. Are we are we, uh, are we are we are we looking at the uh, at the poll from our hammock? I wonder. I wonder. Is, is she is she is she, uh, she going to vote on uh, what she thinks of this website? Okay, I think the results are, are just about in. And wow, look at that answer! I, I couldn't I couldn't be more pleased with these results. So we have uh, we have 99% in favor of this language. A party to a contract must do what he promised. Only one one percent. How many people is that? Two people in the room uh, are are in favor of. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and label that uh, legal jargon. I I think that's really uh, what we the point we want to make here. So. When you're writing your website content, uh, you want to talk directly to your visitors in language that they will understand. Um, keep in mind that you're writing your website content for your prospective clients, not for other lawyers. So uh, speak to your website visitor the same way you would speak to a client in your office or, <clears throat> or on the phone. It's important to maintain continuity between your website voice and your actual voice. You're working to build trust with both of these voices and that's why they really need to be one voice. Your content should put the reader at ease about the law uh, using natural language. Now, that doesn't mean you should talk down to them. Uh, it just means that you should avoid casual use of legal jargon. Sometimes it's appropriate to use legal terminology, absolutely, and, and, uh, and, and that actually can support your SEO, that you're using those, those uh, technical terms. Uh, Google recognizes the authority of those terms, uh, and, and they may sometimes be truly essential to a proper understanding of the legal issue. But when that's the case, you just need to explain them. You, can, you can't just toss off those terms and, and imagine that the, the reader's going to stay with you. Let's take a closer look at the content opportunities in several key sections of your website that strongly influence a reader's decision to call you. The home page, the profile page, the practice area pages, and the blog. We'll start with the home page. Jim, why is the home page such an important part of the website? Oh, the home page, Metaf metaphorically speaking, is the doorway to your office. The home page is more likely than not the strongest page on your website. And by strong, I mean the most linked to page and the one that shows in Google, i.e. it's the door front. You need to capture and engage the user. Google really wants to show your homepage in the results, so optimize the page. Make the content useful. Research what users are searching for and answer it on this page. Your homepage content really needs to answer and reinforce who, what, when, and where. The user is looking for an answer to a search query. Google has come a long way in its search algorithm and has understood that people use more than just keywords. They talk to it. They ask questions. Who? Who is the best personal injury attorney in my area? Where? Where's the closest gyro place? Or for your Greeks out there, the Yero. And for the mobile users, the most frequent use of the words are near me or nearest to me. So use these naturally. Search terms in your content. The first impression. This first impression gives the user a positive experience and tells Google, rank me higher. I can, I'm providing the user the answer he wants. Brian, let me ask you, is it true that we could also say that the home page is where you set yourself apart from everybody else? Definitely. On the home page, we come to the fifth W that we've been holding in reserve for this moment. Uh, the fifth W is why. The reader was satisfied with your first four Ws, as, as you said, the who, what, when, and where. They already know these facts about you. That's, that's why they decided to stay on the website. They were satisfied with those basic details. Now they want to know, why should I hire you? Why are you the attorney for me? What is it about how you practice law that should make me choose you over all of the other attorneys whose first four Ws are the same as yours? Other law firms handling the same practice areas in the same location for roughly the same amount of time. On the home page, you need to show why your way of doing it is better for the reader than those other firms who are doing essentially the same work. Here's an example home page layout. You can see some of the elements that went into the first impression that we talked about before, such as the headers and the introductions where you covered the first four Ws. But for the lasting impression, the core of the page is where you can express the fifth W, the why, and really show what sets you apart. Talk about your firm's accomplishments, your particular way of working with people, your specific approach to this practice area, and keep in mind that you're providing all of this information to build the reader's trust in you and to show the reader the benefit of choosing you. 
The next section of your website that strongly influences a reader's decision to call you is the attorney profile. Jim, what do we know about the importance of the attorney profile? Right. Our Google Analytics shows that once a visitor lands on an engagement page, more likely than not that they then navigate to the attorney page and the possible questions in their mind goes back to the four W's. Who? Who is this lawyer that will rep represent me? What? What else does this lawyer have to offer? Where? Where did this lawyer go to school? And when? When can I meet this lawyer? The attorney profile is where you can provide a quick snapshot of your credentials and your personality. You want to make a personal connection with your reader and help them get to know you better. You want to show a professional picture of yourself. You want details of your education, awards, and achievements. Be open and win their trust and confidence. Bright. Show me an example. Sure. Uh, let's look at a few uh, example attorney profiles. Uh, here's one that provides basic data in a very accessible list and bullet format. A reader can quickly understand this attorney's qualifications, including practice areas, bar admissions, education, memberships, you know, all the basics. You probably have a profile in this form yourself on one or more online legal directories. This format definitely gets the job done in terms of communicating basic information, but it doesn't give the reader much sense of who you are. The reader gets plenty of data, but that's really all they get. Here's another example profile. This one is entirely narrative, and it really brings out the personality of the attorney. The, the reader gets a sense of how this attorney came to choose a law career, or how they chose their practice area, what types of cases have defined them professionally, uh, even a little bit of their uh, personal interests. This kind of narrative bio can really help build trust, but the downside is that it's not so easy to find specific data points. A reader has, who has come to this profile mainly to learn a, a specific fact, such as when did the attorney graduate from law school, they're going to have a harder time finding that detail in this format. So for that reason, we recommend using a hybrid style uh, with a short narrative intro followed by a bullet list, so you really get the best of both worlds. We know that some readers who stayed on your site to learn more are very interested in reading your full story, but we also know that some other readers will still be in that 10-second scan mode when they come to your profile, and you want to make your basic details readily available to those visitors because they're probably still making their initial decision to stay on the website, and they're basing that decision at least partly on those details. The next section of your website that can strongly influence a reader's decision to call you is the practice area content. Jim, what is the essential function of a practice area page? Oh, the practice area page is the answer page. This is the page that will have the visitor contact you. What we call in the SEO industry, like you said, Brian, before, the call to action. The content here is created by good SEO research. You want to anticipate their questions and give them answers. You want to create content using terms people are searching for so you can effectively answer their query, keep them on their page and website longer, then effectively, effectively have them perform a call to action. So, uh, for example, a call, call you, email you, fill out a form, schedule an appointment, and maybe even download a worksheet that calculates child support. You want to write to your audience and their needs. For example, for a bail bonds page, you want to target preferably women, moms, girlfriends, and sisters. Why? Because it's more likely than not it's the guys that get in trouble. And who is doing internet searches to bail out their beloved ones? Surely not the person that's in jail, but their beloved mom or spouse. Show them you understand their problem. Have them trust you and that you have a solution for them. Now here's where it gets important. Google measures the value of your content through user engagement. Google knows whether the visitor is leaving the page, what we call bouncing off. I hear my kids say, LB, let's bounce, like they're not interested. So to the visitor, he's going to LB, bounce. So Google uses this signal as a negative user experience and can devalue your page and website. In addition, Google wants to know, is the visitor sharing this page? Are they bookmarking the page? All these are positive signals for Google, making your page and thus your site rank, rank higher. Brian, give me an example. Sure. Here's an example of a page that doesn't engage with the reader because it doesn't connect with their concerns. It's presented as a practice area page about bankruptcy, but the problem is it, it starts by introducing this technical term, the automatic stay, and then it spends the rest of the page just defining that term by quoting directly from the bankruptcy code. 
this is not the right approach to practice area content on your website for many reasons, but the main reason that we'll talk about today is that it doesn't show the reader that this law firm understands that people have specific questions about the legal process, not about the minutia of the law. You probably wouldn't recite the law to a client in your office for the same reason that you shouldn't recite that law on your website, because it's not what the client or the reader needs from you. It doesn't engage with them. Let's look at another example. Now, this practice area page is also about bankruptcy. It's the same topic, but this one connects with the reader by providing useful information organized in an accessible way. The statute was not useful to a reader facing bankruptcy, but this page is more useful because it addresses common concerns of people facing that issue. It anticipates the questions that brought them to this website addresses the concerns of a, of a reader who wants to know, will this law firm be able to help me resolve my legal problem? Uh, this type of practice area page sends a message that yes, this law firm can help because its website content is informative, it's accessible, and it's relevant to my concerns. The last section of your website that we'll discuss, a section that can strongly influence a reader's decision to call you, is your blog. Uh, let's take one more poll. What are some of the topics that you typically blog about on your website. Do you blog about news about your law firm's activities, legal news items that are relevant to your clients, details of the law that you want to clarify for your clients, perhaps all of the above, or none of the above. You don't blog at all. And you know, it's okay if that's your answer. We're all friends here and this is confidential. Nobody can see you. You're in the privacy of your office or well, I hope you're not in your car. but. Uh, all right, so let's let's see. We got some results coming in now. Let me see. I'm very, Jim. I'm very interested to see this one. The answer is here. Oh, wow. Hey, well, you know, we don't judge here, and thank you for your honesty. So this is very interesting. Uh, relatively even distribution among these uh, different types of things to blog about, but in, in very low, and I, I'm going to be honest, statistically insignificant numbers. Uh, the more than half. Uh, answer none of the above. I don't blog on my website. 28% uh, uh, covering all of those uh, those different topics. Well, you know uh, that's okay. Let's uh, let's all just come together in in uh, in an understanding of the reasons uh, that you should blog uh, on your website, and, and hopefully we can help uh, give you some some confidence and, and point you uh, in that direction. So. Blogs give you an extra opportunity uh, to catch a reader's attention and show that you're actively engaged in the practice of, of law. Uh, whether you're posting timely information, such as news about your firm's activities or updates in the, the law that impact your clients, or maybe you're providing additional detail about common legal situations that your clients want to understand better. Uh, blogs can always be a great way to keep your content fresh. Uh, Jim, do you want to talk about why that's important? Absolutely. You know, blogging introduces new content on the site. You know, when Google crawls your site, it takes a snapshot of your site at the time of the crawl. It then indexes what we call a cache version of your site. And the cache version is what Google uses to rank your site. You want your site to be crawled more often, so Google has more caches of your site. To make sure your site is crawled more frequently, just simply add more content. Google will monitor the change, recache it, and re-rank it. You can blog about anything you like, like a new law that just passed, your opinion on an airline disaster, or anything else of interest in your practice area. New content also keeps your existing visitors coming back, possibly sharing it socially and creating new visitors. Google will see this new increased traffic to your site as a positive ranking signal. Fresh content also helps in the new Panda update. Panda is the ranking algorithm that mainly tells if the site as a whole has thin, low quality, not useful content. Brian, do you have an example? I do. I do have an example. You know, I think this is the first presentation that uh, that we've done where we've talked about panda and we haven't used a picture of a panda. I, I, I think we've I think we've finally moved on from that. Uh, so here's an example of a blog post that uh, that provides additional detail about a specific legal situation that the firm's clients are likely to be concerned about. Uh, the name of this post is "How much discretion do judges have in juvenile drug arrests?" So this really touches on a point of anxiety that a, po a potential client might have. I'm picturing a parent whose teenager has been arrested for marijuana possession, and that parent is looking for a lawyer uh, to not only help the situation, but to put them at ease. That parent wants to feel confident that the attorney they hire has a command of the possible outcomes and is going to be able to communicate clearly about 
those possible outcomes. So this blog post and this style of blog post really lets the reader know that this attorney is in touch with those issues and is connected to their concerns. This attorney is able to see the child's legal situation from the parent's point of view, and that really makes a connection and builds a sense of trust. Those are important objectives for all of the content on your website, and the blog is an especially good tool for achieving those objectives. We should, uh, before we wrap up and take questions, which we'll do in just a few minutes, we should point out that a website is just one part of your online presence. Social media is an important tool for getting your message out, and any content that you create specifically for a social network should definitely use messaging and information that harmonizes with the messaging and the content on your website. Right. You know, we all know that this is important. A little bit of a pain, but it's important. You know, it's a pain because the most important thing is finding con content to post. If you don't have any content, post a picture or retweet something and add a useful comment. You know, you want to create a following, and a following cre creates trust and confidence in your practice. Let's review what we've talked about today. Within the first 10 seconds of arriving at your website, most readers will scan your content, making a quick first impression about you and deciding whether to stay on your site. You need to put the most important information in those areas where people scan. Those areas include your top banner, your page section headers, and your introductions and conclusions. The readers who decide to stay will carefully read other parts of your website content where you need to build trust and make a lasting impression. And those areas include your home page, your profile, your practice area pages, and your blog posts. All of this content should work together to convince readers that you are the attorney they should hire to provide a solution to their problem. Right. Brett, let me just speak a, bit, a little bit about S, the SEO portion. You know, we all know that the SEO is a science unto itself, but in terms of how it relates to content, the main thing to remember about SEO is that Google and other search engines read your website just like your visitors. The search engines look for the headers that make sense, whether they have clear supporting content. They weigh the, they weigh the depth and the freshness of the content to confirm that if they send someone to your site, the visitor is going to find what they need. You, know, you really need to perform keyword research to find out which terms are popular and match that language to your content writing. Then you have to monitor the page, use analytics to keep the content fresh, and what visitors are searching for, and add language to match their queries. Okay, thank you, Brian and Jim. That was very, very informative, and I think everyone also appreciates your senses of humor. Um, we're going to move into the Q&A part of our webinar, and I believe uh, Jim is going to start us off with a question that he received and has an answer for. Right. I have a question here from Marie at InkCloners.com. She says, how frequently do I need to change the content on my site? If I just rework what's there, will Google come out and re-index the site, or do I need to just add fresh content? Well, Marie... Google measures all your web pages for freshness. Some queries need fresher content. For example, what requires fresher content? Example will be like hot topics, recent newsworthy events, or anything that requires updates. For example, new computer software, or maybe in your case, newer printer ink models and cartridges, or changes in the law. In addition, the change of a single sentence won't have a big of a freshness impact as a large change to the main body text. Freshness is more influenced by a new page creation than rather a small same page text change. To the user, if your content is out of date, he's going to press the back button. He's going to LB and choose another URL. Google will monitor this and, and rescore your content and website. Great. Thanks, Marie. Thanks, Jim. Um, all right, so I have another question here submitted by Cynthia. What if one practices something federal like immigration or U.S. export? What geographic area should you emphasize? That's, a, that's a really tricky one. I think uh, Jim and I will in, enjoy addressing that. You know, you, you need to keep in mind that the, you're, trying to, you're trying to engage a client, and that client is, is in a location, and so are you. So you certainly need to acknowledge the reality of any kind of federal practice area, you know, such as uh, immigration or, or bankruptcy, really, although bankruptcy you know, has uh, you know, their, their state 
rules, but you know, uh, bankruptcy at large is a federal issue. All of all of these things, you're going to be addressing the the federal law in your practice area content, but you're connecting with a with a person in your state, in your town, in your area that has has a particular issue. Uh, you need to connect with them in that way. Uh, any any particular aspects of how that federal law plays out uh, in uh, in the conditions that the person is is dealing with locally, um, that that really needs to be your focus, uh, e even as you acknowledge whatever realities there are that the underlying legal situation is is federal. I mean, what, what do you think, Jim? In terms of I agree. SEO? I agree. Well, but what we are targeting when you do federal immigration is we're targeting the visitors in in your area, regardless of whether federal immigration is a national or on law. You're targeting people who are in your area, and you should perform you no, normally a local SEO campaign. Absolutely, because I mean, again, people are uh, you know, someone. Someone who has a concern with with a federal issue is is unlikely to be approaching it from the the point of view of, of that issue as a federal issue. It's their issue. So you know, if I'm sitting here right now and I have an immigration problem and I'm in New, New Providence, New Jersey, I'm I'm not going to I'm not going to Google federal immigration attorney. I'm going to Google New Providence immigration attorney because that's my need. A, a lawyer close to me. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, we have another good question about um, website design. A number of attorneys in our area have used the same website designer. Due to their satis satisfaction and success, we're considering them as well. However, the company offers a limited number of styles, and more likely than not, our design will look very similar to other lawyers in the area. Should we be concerned about design overlap? You know, that, yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think what you you really have to assess the amount of flexibility that is being being, being offered by uh, by when when there's a when there's a limited set of designs when designs are coming from a certain kind of you know, templated approach or you know different themes and, and you know we we have themes here uh, we we feel that our that our themes at, at Martindale uh, although. Certainly, you know, with different different attorneys that may even be within a certain number of miles of each other may be using the same underlying theme, but we make them very, very flexible. Uh, so that uh, you know, I mean, there, there are times actually, believe it or not, this sounds like hype, but it's, it is true that I have been known to bring up sites that are in the same underlying Martindale theme next to each other and not be able to perceive that they are in the same theme because there are so many variations and different paths that our designers are able to go down beyond that theme, uh, whether it's color or structure or layout and and, um, and and choices of photos. So I, I think my answer to your question is you just really need to examine the amount of flexibility. Is it a risk that your website might end up looking just like somebody else? Um, you know, yes, it is. You, you really need to take a look at uh, how much you're able to do uh, to make that differentiation in whatever kind of themed presentation is being offered by the website provider that you're going to work with. Yeah, I mean, we've used. And I've seen a lot of WordPress sites that follow the same HTML coding. But what really makes stands out is what you're writing. What is the substance of your content and how and how are you writing it? You if you're writing so differently than another person, even though they might be identical, your website will be differentiated from, from everybody else. Okay, great. Some good ideas there. Um, we have another question from Peter uh, about embedding videos. Since most readers will only scan and not read your web content, is embedding videos above your content a good idea to increase engagement and to convey the law firm's message? I'm going to give a, a really short answer to that because I could. You know, the, uh, uh, an entire discussion, uh, uh, you know, a, a whole separate webinar could definitely be had on the, on the use of video today. In fact, uh, some of our uh, staff has very recently been blogging about that on our, our blog at uh, Martindale slash Market Your Firm. Um, Video is very important today. Uh, you know, really, you should you should go to our website and read that blog to understand why that is. But the short answer is yes, video is very important, and uh, and we're using it more and and more here in conjunction with written content. That's a short answer to a, a very big discussion, and uh, perhaps that will be something we uh, you see in this forum in the future. Right, videos really do engage uh, the user. You know, you might have a video, and the first thing you see is a snapshot of of the person of the attorney. You want to click the video. You want to engage. You want to see what he has to say. You, what, you, what the video is doing is building trust and confidence. So regardless of the content, let them hear you. That adds more value to the user. 
It's interesting you say let them hear you, though, because I, I think there's a lot of controversy about the idea of auto roll. Should uh, should videos that are present on a page just begin to play themselves without the user taking action? And a lot of people feel very strongly uh, on either side of that, and I feel like that's still sort of just an open discussion in in the industry at the moment, like where that's that's all going to go. Yeah, that could, that also could be annoying, and it yes. could also like LB. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there you go. Okay, so regarding blog posts, um, my home page contains blog posts, good job, but is there a difference in where the posts should be? Should they be later in the site, on the home page? Well, you know, I think um, the, the post itself, uh, I, I, you wouldn't want the, the body content of your home page to be a blog post. I mean, that's sort of the way blogging began, uh, that, that uh, you know, a standalone blog, uh, you know, the, the last thing you posted would be the home page of the website. That's actually how WordPress was was built in the beginning, but now in terms of a site like this where you're encapsulating your entire practice and you have many different goals that you're trying to achieve on the website, the blog has a place within your website, and in terms of being at the end, you know, you, you want to sort of push yourself away from looking at, at the website as a start to finish thing. You know, it isn't a book where people are going to begin at the beginning and, and go to the end. They're going to move fluidly through your website looking for the kinds of things that they need and making choices that they want to make. So uh, should your blog be readily available from the home page? Absolutely, as should every other part of your website. So the kind of experience you want to create for the user of accessing your content is, you know, as Jim said before during the presentation, it's, it's, the, it's the doorway, right? It's, it's the entry point, and you're stepping into, you know, the beautiful atrium, and from that point you can see all the other doors in this great big lovely uh, house or office building or, or whatever it is, and one of those doors is the blog and another one is your attorney profile, and, and there's really you know, equal access uh, so that users can make their choice about the kind of information they want to go after. It's all right there for them. Right, you know, you know the purpose of the blog, as we said before, you know, it's to create more traffic, you want to expand your audience, you want to engage your current customers, and then keep them informed. You know, so you want to expand on a thought or discussion, write about it. You know, if you have content to support some of those ideas, then go ahead, blog away. Okay, great. Um, we have a great question here about content on the page. What is your recommendation on amount of content per page? Number of words per page or the length of the page? Sure. I'm, you know, I'm going to throw out what I, I haven't actually touched base with, with Jim on this in a while because I know this is, this is a moving target, you know, the idea of number of words, and uh, there are definitely times where we say, you know, the number doesn't matter as long as the substance. And I, I really, at the end of the day, I think that is the truth. You know, if the substance is there, then there's not a hard number on it. But I, I know that people need that number, and honestly, I have to use it too. Uh, I think that our general, this is very broad, I'm going to speak as broadly as I possibly can, but our, uh, our target for content on any given typical page from a home page to a practice area page uh, can vary from 400 to 800 words. Uh, much less than 400, Google is really not going to have enough content to crawl to really make a serious uh, Im impression about what's going on there, uh, unless, uh, you know, you, you kind of be put in a place of having to keyword stuff in order to have an, enough for Google to process and, and you don't want to do that. Beyond 800 words is really more of a conversion issue. Uh, we, it's really our experience and, and studies have shown this. That, you know, as we said in this discussion today, people just don't want to read that much, and they're not going to they're not going to stay with you for 800 words. And they may even just be turned off by the look of the page at all, seeming like it's it's going on for for that long. And it's better to have a concise argument. But again, this is very broad and subject to many other factors and, and conditions that can be specific to the situation, I think. What do you think, Jim, with right, numbers? Right. I mean, uh, the amount of content also depends on your practice area and its competition. Mm -hmm. You know, take a look at your competition. Do they have pages and pages of uh, topics supporting each, each type of written content? You could have a 400-word page uh, content, but have 10 pages below that supporting that content. So, you know, Google looks at the whole rather than just one page. Agreed, yeah, and I, I like the idea of that. I mean, if, if I'm going to make a choice between having one, you know, monster page about family law and all of the different components of that versus having a good, tight, you know, four to five hundred word family law overview and then many multiple pages nested under that with concise arguments about, about each of those areas, you know, I'm definitely going to choose the latter and I think Google's going to appreciate that whole in that way, like you say. And the user as well, definitely. Yes, the user for mm -hmm. sure.
Okay, and speaking of content, we have a, a specific question. Should we refer to past settlement numbers? Does that speak to potential clients? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we, we know that you know, this is very similar to the idea of uh, it's kind of an alternative path to, to getting reviews on your site, which is a, a, a recent webinar that, that we had about the importance of getting uh, user, user reviews, previous customer reviews. People are looking at that more and more uh, on the Internet and, and taking that very seriously, and kind of an in-between step to that, I mean, kind of before user reviews became the Internet thing that it was, uh, what you had was just listing your results, and, uh, and absolutely, uh, people, people value that very much. I mean, that can, you know, you have to use your discretion with that, obviously, it's, uh, there, there are uh, bar ethics rules issues in certain states about what you're allowed to present and what you're not, and often there have to be uh, many very specific disclaimers about particular things that uh, you present in that regard in terms of your results, but we, you know, within all those parameters, which, you know, it's really up to you to know for your individual state, um, it's, it's our experience, and again, research has shown that those are very valuable in uh, and giving people uh, a good impression of, of what you can potentially do for them. Yeah, it goes back to is the settlement going to answer their query? Do they, do they have trust in you? Are they going to answer? Are they going to settle this case? Are they going to win something for me? Is this who the lawyer I'm choosing? Is this what I'm going to choose? Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, how about is there a way to check your score with Google on your content? I mean, is there a software, is there, a, could you repeat the question? Is there a way to check your score with Google on your content? A page, it's analytics. Like analytics, yeah. right, right. You want to, uh, well, you actually want to just take a common sense approach. You know, Google's not going to give you a score. You want to look at it or have someone in the office take a look at it. Look for the basic things, look for keyword stuffing, look for the who, is the who there, is the what there. You want to write to your reader, you want to engage the reader. Google will see the engagement and, and rank you and rescore you. You want to refresh the content, you want to have, you want to create more pages in addition to. And that, that will decide whether Google will rank you and, and how they will rescore you. Okay, thank you. And how about um, what do you do with an H1 if you practice in more than one area? Mm, yes, that's a, a huge challenge. You know, if you um, if you practice in multiple areas, then your your homepage H1 needs to reflect that. You know, I, I think that's just that's just the reality. Um, if you practice in multiple areas, that it, and it's important to you to showcase those areas. I mean, I think I think it, it, it depends on what you mean by practicing in multiple areas. If you if you equally handle personal injury and criminal defense just those two areas in a 50-50 balance in your website, then the H1 of your homepage absolutely must present those uh, in equal measure because that's your message. You know, that's how you're positioning yourself. It gets a little more complicated if, uh, if it's, you know, 40% criminal and 40% personal injury, but then you've got, you know, 10% of family law in there and you've got 10% of immigration. That gets complicated both for your messaging uh, to uh, people who come to your website and it's also very tricky uh, for SEO. Uh, you know, what do you, what do you think about complex right. situations like that, Jim? I took the uh, question as if you practice in many locations, so, uh, if, if that was, if I was correct. If you have so many areas, if you want to practice in all of New Jersey and you have one office location, ah. for example, in Newark, okay. you really don't want to keyword stuff the cities in your H1. As to your areas of practice, you really want to target one or main two, one to two topics per page. So if you, your H1 should contain and be concise for those main topics. So either, no matter how we, so we interpreted the question differently, which is, which is funny, um, but we, I think what we're hearing is that no matter how we interpreted that question, um, you, if you've got some important levels of focus that you need to, you want to communicate, then you do need to communicate those, but you do want to try to keep that focus. You know, you, you can't achieve absolutely everything in one H1 or really in one, any other one single place. You know, you can't, you can't tell uh, uh, an enormously broad story. You, you need to have uh, some kind of focus. And that's a, that's a business issue as much as it is a website issue, I think. Okay, that's good. Um, and probably this will be our last question, which is a good one. After a website is up and running, how much time should be spent on a weekly basis maintaining and updating the site? 
Wow, on a weekly basis. I'm, I'm really impressed to hear that, that we, uh, we have someone out there who is even thinking of the possibility of, man of looking at their website on a weekly basis. I mean, sometimes we have to push to, uh, on the idea that you should look at your website more than once a year. So that's, that's great. I, I love the spirit uh, that that's coming from. Now, in, you know, in terms of maintenance, uh, I think uh, you're, you certainly should not be in such a you, – you should be thinking of uh, – you, you should be noting that the blog is the most uh, kind of flexible – uh, area of your website, and that's really the area where your most focus is going to be in terms of updating and refreshing content. Um, I tend to not look at the the rest of the website as a whole as a place that it would be at a weekly level of updates. I think that would that would be a little bit too much because you want to create a certain sense of uh, of stability in in terms of people visiting your website. You know, if you're if you're sort of pivoting your message on a weekly basis in the core content of your website, you know that 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 suggests the you know, sort of sort of instability. I mean, you know, what is what is that what does that do for SEO? Is, is, there, is there such thing as refreshing content too much, Jim? No, not at all. What, what usually we find is that you do have st static content on the pages. And you can monitor how people go into that with analytics, what terms they're using, and you can always refresh the content to make sure that you're answering their query and their answers. But the blog avenue is the way to go if you really want to add something new, fresh, something that's hot something that's going to give you some buzz that people would want to engage and keep coming back to your site. So I guess to, to, to give a, a really direct answer to the question, uh, you know, how often do I do I need to go in there and do that? What, what's a sort of general recommendation for how often you need to touch base on the site to, to try to get a sense of, of that performance and possibly make adjustments on what we would otherwise call the static content? How, how often should the average uh, law firm be really looking at their content performance at that level? Uh, usually we, we used to spend uh, once a week is a great time just once to look, just to keep it out. If you have an, an idea, you want to know what's going on on a weekly basis. Um, something might pop up in your head, you might see something on your content that you want to change or you want to add to and maybe make a new page. Great. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Brian and Jim. A lot of useful information there. Um, we are just about out of time, and I just would like to remind everyone, because we've had a few questions come in, um, first of all, you will be receiving a recording of this webinar and a copy of the PowerPoint. That will go out to you in a couple of days via an email. Secondly, if we did not get to your question, because we had quite a lot of them submitted, we will be answering those um, at, at some point in the very near future, we will respond to your questions. And um, thirdly, you will be receiving a survey uh, right after this webinar and then possibly in another day or two in the email. If you could uh, take just a minute and answer that survey, we'd love some feedback on our own content of the webinar as well as um, to hear about any technical issues that you might have had. So we thank you so much for joining us today and hope you have a wonderful afternoon and a great weekend. Thanks again. Thank you.